To understand the origin and motivating factor of the civil rights movement, it helps to consider prior experiences of African Americans beginning with their arrival to the present day United States. In 1619, the first African slaves were brought to Jamestown, Virginia. With no rights and terrible mistreatment, their miserable condition continued for over 200 years. It wasn't until after the Civil War that slavery was abolished through the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was ratified three years later, which granted citizenship to ex-slaves, and the 15th Amendment gave African American men the right to vote. Unfortunately, many states, predominantly in the South, found loopholes through which they greatly limited African American rights. Oppressive policies like Jim Crow laws and black codes were established. While Jim Crow laws legalized racial segregation, black codes kept African Americans as a cheap labor force. Furthermore, to counter the 15th Amendment, poll taxes and literacy tests were issued. Almost three decades later, in 1896, the U.S. Supreme Court case known as Plessy v. Ferguson challenged segregation in Louisiana train cars. The ruling was that segregation was permitted as long as both races had access to equal facilities, which is where the phrase separate but equal originated. As history shows, the facilities were in fact not equal. These injustices and hindrances to freedom were bound to stir displeasure and unsatisfaction among African Americans who wanted to see prominent change in their citizenship status. And in 1954, a landmark case appeared in the Supreme Court that would get them one step closer. In Topeka, Kansas, a man named Oliver Brown wanted his daughter to attend an all-white elementary school. The four African-American schools that the state did have were situated at too great a distance for the family. However, Brown's daughter was not granted admission and he filed a lawsuit. There were other similar cases and with the help of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People and Thurgood Marshall, chief counsel of the NAACP, who would later go on to be the first African-American Supreme Court justice, segregation in schools was declared illegal. Chief Justice Earl Warren's statement from the case's transcript read, We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and other similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. This disposition makes unnecessary any discussion whether such segregation also violates the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. On December 1, 1955, a member of the NAACP named Rosa Parks challenged a law in Alabama that required African Americans to sit at the back of the bus and surrender their seat to white people who didn't have one. When Parks refused to give up her seat, she was arrested. She lost her job at a department store because of her actions, but a successful bus boycott began which was led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a young minister. The African American community walked or carpooled together as a means of transportation instead of using buses. And finally, in November of 1956, segregation on buses was ruled illegal and the boycott ended. After the ruling of Brown versus Board of Education, many Southern schools did not comply with integration. Little Rock Central High School was a prime example. The danger to the nine black students was so great because of the white mobs and violence from opposition to integration that Eisenhower sent in troops to protect them. Still, that did not prevent the mob from hurling insults. One of the students, Elizabeth Eckford, stated, I tried to see a friendly face somewhere in the mob, someone who maybe would help. I looked into the face of an old woman and it seemed a kind face, but when I looked at her again, she spat on me. In Greensboro, North Carolina, four college students pioneered a new method of nonviolent protest. A Woolworths diner did not serve black people, so the four students utilized a sit-in. They came in every day for weeks, sat at the counter, and refused to move. The sit-in movement quickly spread and was used with freedom marches, boycotts, and other forms of nonviolent protest. A New York Times article discussed the sit-in, saying, The demonstrations were generally dismissed at first as another college fad. This opinion lost adherence, however, as the movement spread, some whites wrote off the episodes as the work of outside agitators, but even they conceded that the seeds of dissent had fallen in fertile soil. The civil rights movement was seeing slow and steady progress. A drastic leap, however, was made on August 28, 1963. 250,000 people, both black and white, gathered in Washington, D.C. in front of the Lincoln Memorial to support a civil rights bill. There were speakers and musicians that spoke and sang for equal rights. This was the event during which Dr. King's famous I Have a Dream speech was delivered. 
But I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. In the summer of 1964, the Congress of Racial Equality and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was a college civil rights organization, organized Freedom Summer. More than 700 whites were trained to help African Americans register to vote in Mississippi. Freedom schools were established in which African Americans were taught reading and writing. The white volunteers that stayed with African American families were beaten, harassed, and arrested, and the results of the program were underwhelming. 70,000 African Americans tried to register, but only 1,600 actually became voters. But they felt a new sense of pride and strength. That same year, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was approved by President Johnson as a result of the March on Washington. It did not come easy, though. The bill was argued over for 80 days in Congress. It is considered the most important civil rights law in U.S. history. The accomplishments of the bill were that it made discrimination illegal in public places, and it also gave the government ways to enforce civil rights laws. On March 7, 1965, protesters led by King marched from Selma to Montgomery for voting rights. When they arrived, they were blocked and attacked by authorities after being told to leave. The assault on the peaceful marchers is known as Bloody Sunday. This did not deter King and his followers from marching again. He led a second march, and there was also a third march, this time protected by President Johnson. The third march was actually a second Selma to Montgomery march. It took one week to get from Selma to Montgomery. Unfortunately, like previous events, the protesters were met with resistance and a volunteer was shot and killed by a KKK member. Ultimately, the goal of the marches was achieved. The following summer, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed, requiring states such as Mississippi and Alabama to register eligible African American voters. This caused voting numbers within the African American community to skyrocket in the South. African Americans no longer had to face challenges like poll taxes and literacy tests like they did when the 15th Amendment was passed. Those that were growing impatient with Martin Luther King Jr.'s old and slow ways started using new forms of protest. The Black Panthers was created in 1966, which was a radical militant organization. They discussed killing white police, but also started education, health, and economic programs for urban African Americans. Another group called the Nation of Islam advised African Americans to stay separate from whites. The shift in the perception of nonviolent protest and integration gave rise to leaders with new attitudes. Stokely Carmichael, an SNCC leader, advocated black power. He believed African Americans should have pride in being black and start taking charge of their own neighborhoods. Another significant figure was Malcolm X. Originally named Malcolm Little, he joined the Nation of Islam and changed his last name to X after conversion. He preached self-determination and self-defense and labeled white people and institutions evil. Interestingly, towards the end of his life, he no longer called whites evil and he sought alliances with King and other civil rights leaders, though he still believed in black self-determination. This did not bode well for Malcolm as blacks from the Nation of Islam were not fond of his actions and ended up killing him a year before the formation of the Black Panthers. Unfortunately, another prominent leader was assassinated at the Lorraine Motel three years later on April 4th. Though Martin Luther King Jr. had passed, there was still momentum in the civil rights movement that propelled it into the beginning of the 70s. Federal courts ordered urban schools to start busing students for a better racial balance. Children rode the bus for a long time each day and inevitably many white parents were upset because they didn't want their children going to schools in poor neighborhoods. However, African Americans benefited greatly. Graduation rate within their community rose. They were receiving better education and more went to college and got decent jobs. The Civil Rights Movement was an arduous but determined struggle for the rights of African Americans. It tested the credibility of political leaders, revealed the brutality of white America's superiority complex, and most importantly, made notable breakthroughs in social justice. With the days of slavery and legal discrimination behind them, African Americans could look to a wide range of future possibilities. One of those possibilities would become a reality when Barack Obama became the first black president of the United States in 2008. While the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s is over, today there is news all over social media and news articles that speak of systemic oppression towards African Americans. 
Hopefully it won't have to come to it, but if another civil rights movement was to occur, one would not have to look far for inspiration with past figures like Dr. King and Thurgood Marshall. Ultimately, the civil rights movement shouldn't have to be repeated. Instead, it should be a lesson and a reminder for America to not take any more steps backwards.